settle back <laughs> and you wait just a couple of moments anticipating the effervescence, the ebullience, the scintillating Dr. Reverend Sonia Davidson, who is about to address you, not only with vim, vigor, and vitality, I assure you, but also with words of wisdom. Reverend Sonia, over to you. Morning, morning, everyone. Morning, Boy, Reverend thank Sonia. you for that introduction, Reverend Michael. And if I wasn't feeling it, I feel it now. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's such an honor to share it with my colleague minister this morning, Reverend Michael Record. No. My topic this morning is boldly walking in the light of truth. Interestingly, I'm starting with a statement that I can say with certainty that there is none of us listening this morning who has never experienced fear. I can say this because fear is a biological fact. And any one of you who saw the little creature running across the floor this morning <laughs> will know that sometimes the fear appears to be irrational. It may be even genetically imbued. <laughs> because I cannot understand why one little lizard could be <laughs> the cause of such universal apprehension. Right? <laughs> there are a few people who will not confess to being afraid of a lizard. <laughs> I have a relative who will not come to my house because I have many pictures, and behind the pictures, lizards have taken sanctuary. <laughs> so she won't come. Uh, oh, Mary Baker says, me too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, right? I could name some of the fears that I have. Some of them have become muted because as we go through life, and especially as we have learned how to walk boldly in the light of truth, they become muted, but they are, there's always there behind somewhere. And we must, we ask ourselves, within ourselves, is there anywhere in my life that fear is playing a dominant role at this time? Sometimes the answer may not be there because, as I say, Fear is very subtle. It can hide anywhere in our subconscious mind. However, having said that fear is a biological fact, I want to point out that fear is important. It is important for many, many reasons, not the least of all. It has an important job to do, keeping us alive. Fear is our arousal system that sets off our alarms, it wakes us up, yes, to act. Without it, we might challenge dangerous animals, including people, or throw ourselves off cliffs. We might challenge ourselves to even feel pain. It is that which makes us be sensible in the body. Remember I said it's a biological fact, it's not a spiritual fact. So, you know, without fear, sometimes, you know, we'd roll over in bed and go back to sleep when it's time for work. Yes, it is a protection instinct because the work needs to be done. Now, every fear situation occurs, whenever it occurs, our brain automatically receives a message, sends it to our body, and we get an uncomfortable feeling, and we attempt to get away from danger. However, if the threat is so overwhelming, sometimes we freeze, we just freeze, we can't move. Or sometimes it might be overwhelming in a positive way, when love, for example, or the need to take action is so strong. 
that you forget about the fear. The body just is neutralized in that moment. I had that experience, I've shared it once long ago, when I, who was not a swimmer, jumped into the deep end of a pool, grabbed my knees and dug her out. And after I came out, I started to tremble because I then remembered that I could not swim. <laughs> so it works both ways. In some situations, the fear is just in the background so that we are not even admitting to it. But it sometimes prevents us from just going out and enjoying life to the fullest. I hear it is a lovely experience, I've been there once, to go down to Coronation Market and just experience the beauty of all the produce and all that sort of thing. I won't say that I am conscious of being afraid of going, but I have never tried to just discover the adventure of going back again, right? I know I can admit to one fear is one uncomfortable feeling, I've labeled it fear, is for heights. When I'm in very high places, I feel a very uncomfortable feeling in my body. And so I have decided that it is fear, although it does not come with an emotion of fear, but it doesn't make me feel good, so I don't experience it as much as I could. I don't mean climbing up into a mountain. I mean if I was into a very high place looking down. No. So, yes, fear can rob us of the true enjoyment of life if we are too protective of this we call the body. Yes, the real adventure is out there to be experienced. But I ask myself, what if the earliest Homo sapiens, humans, the species that we belong to, of humanity that we belong to, what if it had remained in the little village in Africa instead of boldly facing what seemed to have been unknown threats? What if having left and dared to travel, I had not dared to travel across the planet and spread across to enjoy the beauty of this wonderful planet? What if it is what was so terrified that it's not just face living in, in, in the unknown, experiencing the unknown, living in caves, weathering the ice age even. It had to take courage. What about the seafarers who struck out into deep waters and moved across the planet to discover unknown lands? You know, we ourselves, we ourselves are always, it doesn't matter how small the adventure, we are always experiencing new things and new experiences. And we do it sometimes without even realizing what we are doing. Just as the early ancestors found courage to go after distant goals without knowing for sure what they'd find, yes, so we have gone after distant experiences as we go through life. Remember, a child is born feeling so bold and adventurous, a child will try to walk, even though falling down many times, and they will smile and think it's fun. And that's, the, that's how we are programmed, we're born that way. I saw on the internet a little child who had not yet learned to walk, and that child was aiming for, a, in a high place, there was something the child wanted. I think it was a soother. And the child was able to climb and climb and struggled to climb. And when the child reached that high place and got the soother, the laughter and the chuckling, somebody was taking the camera, so obviously somebody who was watching had great confidence in that, per, in that child. And the joy with which that child chuckled when they achieved their goal. We ourselves, if we think back, we can find so many times when we have gone after something 
This island is full of things to discover. All kind of beautiful, fantastic things. I am seeing most of them now on the internet, things I never knew before. But I know that when I was much younger, I actually thought it was such a wonderful, brave, and adventurous thing to climb the Duns River Falls. Can you imagine? How many of us have climbed the Duns River Falls? Quite a few. Those of you who haven't done it, take a trip just to challenge yourself, right? No. I am sure if we think back, there have been times I can remember that particular time when I have overcome that potential for fear and did something beyond, you know, what I would have done ordinarily. But I can also look back now. I had a, the opportunity to look back on a resume that I wrote for myself. It was in 2016. And I had not looked at it. Mind you, it had vision, mission. And I had not looked at it since I wrote it for a particular purpose. You remember what was read this morning about the vision, right? Get the vision and put it in front of you and let it push you, right? I had not looked at it. And when I looked at the vision, mind it was a little wordy because they say you really so should be writing one line that you can remember and just have that embedded in your consciousness and walk with it and just have it everywhere. That's what Dr. Um, Dennis Merritt Jones suggested. Have it there. Put it there so you can see it. He says marinate in it. Just like oh, the vision for our church, he says marinate in it. I'm not going to embarrass us. No, I'm going to say how many of us know the vision of our church? I'm not going to ask you to recite it. Mm -hmm. Two of us, three of us, okay? So make it your business to get the vision for your church. And he says, marinate yourself in it. Because in that way, you will be actually helping to create, to be participate in the mission and help to create the kind of church that you want to be a part of the kind of church which he says he wants to leave for his grandchildren. I don't know if he has any yet, but he's thinking way ahead. He wants a place where his grandchildren can come. So we're going to marinate in it. No, for ourselves, take a moment. I'm giving you a moment, whether here or online, and just think about when you think about yourself. What do you think is the biggest gift that you bring to this world? That which is so you. And when you think about you, it is you, you, you. Think about it for a second. And allow yourself to clarify it. Later on this week, clarify it. Take it, clarify it. Take it with you and work with it. Work with it because... When fear comes in its subtle way and tells you, like it probably did to me, why I have three unpublished books, two of them already written, one fully edited, one and a one with a wonderful title, which is a surprise. I'm not sharing it until it, it's out there, but it's, I think it's a wonderful title, which just fits me. Yes. Why? Was it because I, there was some subliminal fear of some sort why I had not gone ahead and done it? It could even be fear that it's too much work, you know, or it, could, it can be any fear. I have not allowed it to surface, and I'm not even going to go there because I know how to deal. I don't even have to route out that fear. I'm going to make that fear I'm going to recognize it, yes, that it exists, even if I don't know the, specific of the specifics of it. I'm going to face it when, I, when it does surface. I'm not going to repress it. Um, in fact, I'm going to meet it with interest and ask, not with embarrassment, shame, or any trepidation, just ask, hmm, where did that come from? It might have come from way back when, you know. Um, I'm told, for example, 
that one of, if you look at the 10 top fears, some of you may have seen that, the 10 top fears that humans face. I think this one was done in North America, but it has been replicated elsewhere. Do you know what the top fear is for humans? Yes, public speaking specifically, yes. Mm -hmm, yeah. But uh, also anything to do with interacting with people. So many people give themselves excuses for not, you know, interacting with people, right? Sometimes after church you run away and you don't make eye contact. Or you don't want to go to a party because mm, you don't like parties, you don't give all kinds of things. So the one that is uppermost is the one that has to do with interacting people. Why? Because we are too caught up in what people think about us. And the same thing with public speaking, right? I can't feel afraid or anywhere in this church when I'm looking at all the beautiful faces just wanting me to do well, right? Listening to me and sending me loving thoughts. Yeah, but I have to prepare myself still. But yet I know and feel comfortable when you have a fear, what, is it, what do you think is one of the most practical things to do? Do it anyway. Do it, right? Do it anyway. It's like swimming. I, I, I don't want it to be like how they taught my brother to swim, where they just tossed him into the deep end, and after several minutes of flattering around and squirting and so on, somebody decided to rescue him, right? I'd much rather it be that we learned a method to deal with it, a systematic method, and which we can, we'll talk about later. But also we can use this fear as a propellant, an energy, an energy, right, which we, we will not even call it fear anymore. It's a, we call it an enthusiasm to get going and to do and to be and to follow our vision. And in that process, we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. So we can be a champion to things, a champion to the very things that we might be fearful about. So that we no longer have to, to just shrink away, but we find joy in going after making life a better place. So that the things which we hitherto would be afraid of. For example, I am thinking of how many of us who are aware that some young, many young persons, I don't know how many, it may be fewer than we think, many young persons are resorting to, a, you know, crime, what we call crime. How many of us, well, I'm old enough to remember that so many young people were in, found in my household were not related to us. They would just come because a relative wanted to get them, you know, to, to just live in a place where they could find love and whatever. We didn't question it. They were just there. Sometimes I ask how many of us are aware that our helpers who work for us and leave our homes in the dark, have children who are in the inner city being brought up by people who they think show them love, but they have to pay in, they have to pay in advance for that so-called love that they're being shown. Can't we have these children come to our homes and stay there if, they ha ever, if the helper ever has to be late and just be there in a home which is sheltered and protected? Maybe it's the only time they'll ever meet somebody who has that kind of layout, if you call your home a layout. We can do something about it. Act on it. Let what seems to be our fear of what's going on, let us act in a way to contribute to the transmuting of it. And we can strive to be anchored in spirit because we know that we can sing the song. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? Of whom shall I be afraid? The enemies in our own household. 
said the master Jesus. And there's a passage from a book that was given to me by Reverend Maxine. It's from White Eagle's teaching, Jesus, Teacher and Healer. And I noticed I wrote out this passage in my journal, December 27, 2021. I'm not sure what was going on. It says, you must allow the power within you to come into operation. In this way, you're opening yourself to the divine flow. Be not anxious. Just surrender yourself to the all-loving God. For all is love, and none of you need to fear life, either the life here or the life in spirit. There is nothing to fear at all. But despite all of what we know, all of our teachings, there are times when special times may challenge our arousal system, our fear factor is heightened. We know that faith overcomes fear, so we say have faith in our faith. Don't deny our faith by saying, I wish I had more faith. That is Norman Cousins. He says, I wish I had faith like so-and-so. I wish I could pray like so-and-so. We need to know that everything that we could ever want was planted in us at the time when the divine decided to come into manifestation as an expression of itself, as our unique self. And there are so many affirmations. I took some in the form of Psalms because they are readily available and easy to share with our friends that can boost us. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 46. Psalm 121, I lift up mine eyes unto the hills, my help cometh from the Lord, which has made heaven and earth. Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? And uh, remember, a man's enemies is in his own household. So these special times, I remember this word, I use it special times because I remember I was visiting our neighbor, Cuba. My daughter was in school there, and I had brought some food and other basic necessities for her. I spent two weeks in the dorm and had a lesson of a lifetime interacting with the students there. There were Cuban students mostly, and there were foreign students. Their living conditions were sparse. They had little other than the bare necessities. They walked or rode bicycles because cars were few and fuel was scarce. However, you would never have known that it mattered. They congregated in rooms and laughed and chatted amongst themselves and their foreign students, and they shared what little they had. The memory of the, co the comment or question I posed to one of the students, that question has faded, but what has stuck in my mind is his response, he said, we are living through special times. He said it calmly, no anger, no sadness, no fear. Living through special times was his response. I may have asked him, I don't know. I may have asked him, how are they feeling about what's going on now? How are they coping? We are living through special times. I never heard another word other than that through the mouths of these students. There is an interesting related biblical story from, um, I, I have come upon it, right? It came upon it from a chapter in a book by Emily Cady called How I Use Truth. Reverend Anne and I have just finished teaching it and I am suggesting that you download the book. It's available free, right? online, and it was the, tap, the chapter that I am focusing on is trusting and resting. The story that I am focusing on is set in the bibli biblical kingdom of Judah. The king at that time was a Jehoshaphat. The news came to the king that an army 
which was a coalition of armies of three and more countries, was advancing to attack his people. Now, this was a little kingdom, and Joseph, Joseph didn't have much of an army. So he had no idea what to do to repel the attack. But he immediately knew what he didn't know what to do to repel the attack, but he knew what he should do. So what? What do you think he did? He called all the people together, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they waited for an answer. They waited. Then the answer came through the high priest. No, Jehoshaphat was a, was a logical man. He was a thinker, right? And he, he, that was his solution at the time, right? But the high priest came to him and he, heard, he got the answer. He said, the voice of God said, Be not afraid of the mul this multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. O Judah, fear not, but go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Ye shall not need to fight this battle. Say to yourself, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord with you. Stand still. How many times have we heard in this church, be still. Whenever we meet a challenge that seems overwhelming, what do you do? Become still. And if in, you notice in verse, he prayed. He prayed until he got the message, but in that prayer came the stillness. So what did the king do? He was told to go out. Go out. He didn't question it. Go out. Can you imagine? You have a big, big, big army coming at you, and you just go. When you hear that still, small voice, you just act. You are prompted to act. There's no fear. There's just quietness and stillness in you, and you go. He said, go out early in the morning. Sleep on it and go out fresh. And so they went out, and guess what he did? The king sent his little army out with a big band of singers. The congregation went out and they were singing and praising the Lord, making a huge noise. And guess what happened? The armies were hijacked. They were ambushed before they came because there was this huge noise. They were ambushed. And they never even had to fight. There was no fighting that was necessary. The message is clear. The enemy is of our own household. This band of persons, the, 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 the armies that are coming at us, sometimes it's our own naysaying mind that says, no, 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 the fear, that is a metaphor for our fears. And when we stand still and see the salvation of the Lord and know that the battle is not ours because the law which is there, the law of God is there. The battle to be fought is not a physical battle, it's one of peace and tranquility. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The Lord is my strength, you can see. God is my assured victory. I will trust in God. And God will bring it to pass. God will bring it to pass. Friends, we know. We need to, there are many things that this church offers us. Opportunities to practice being still. To learn how to pray. To study and understand more about ourselves. And about the self, the God self. We need to use up more of that time. There's a wonderful experience we call prayer power. And we have been meeting diligently for now 41 years next week. A small band of persons meeting quietly, learning how to listen to the still small voice and to obey it. And to be prompted to listen and to pray, to share anything that comes. Because the practice of the silence is important. I am throwing it out to you that 
in your own room, in your own bedrooms, wherever you are, or with a group of persons of your choosing. Or if you choose to come to prayer power, we'd be glad. It is important to have a time when you're neither praying, talking to God, praying, putting things into the law of mind, when we're neither listening to others, encourage us, but we are learning to be still, to stand still, and know. Until then, we will begin to hear that voice as loud, right? They call it the, the thunder of the silence. We'll be able to hear and practice to know wherever we are and whatever we're doing, whatever situation we meet that may be fearful, there is always that still small voice that's directing us, that is telling us what to do, how to do, when to do, and we have no difficulty responding to it because we will recognize it as a voice of love. And a Brandon Cox, pastor of Saddleback Church, gives us a nice little quote. And this is in response to the, the um, perfect love cast out fair, 1 John 4, 28. He says, you can be led by fear or you can be led by love. Choose which one. And I would love you to join me this week in clearing the way for a greater expression of joy like the praise singers of Jehoshaphat's Judah. Sing out loud. Sing out strong. I challenge you to sing this little song from our childhood. I want you to sing it twice per day. And I want the chorus. Is Valerie there? I want to sing the chorus. We're going to sing it, and I'm going to ask you to sing it. You can find the YouTube version if you don't remember it. And I want you to sing it twice per day. Sing it, and you will see that everything that is in your uppermost mind that may be worrisome or any sadness that may be causing you to have muted fear come to take charge, you will watch in wonder and awe as unexpected and expected treasures appear. So let's sing it. Come, come, come your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. Again, because I know. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. You can sing it, and guess what? You will see, I promise you, you will see things begin to happen as your fears that you are, didn't even know you had are muted and your life begins to take on something even greater than what you're experiencing now. I know it is great. And I have an affirmation for you, which is God is my strength. God is my assured victory. I will trust God. And God will bring it to pass. I'm going to break it down. God is my strength. God is my strength. God is my assured victory. God is my assured victory. I will trust God. I will trust God. And God will bring it to pass. And God, and God will, will bring, bring it, to, it pass. to pass. Thank you, Emily Cady. I am advising you and asking you to explore that wonderful book, how I Use Truth by Dr. Emily Cady. I am sure you will enjoy it and your life will take on greater richness. Namaste. Thank you so much, Reverend Sonia. 
that was a, we could call it a multifaceted talk. We heard about the importance of fear. Its importance, it's a biologic, it has a biological source, fear. And for that reason, it is useful. And uh, so no doubt it is because we have that source of fear in us that the human race has thrived these hundreds of thousands of years. So we are afraid of things that we should be afraid of, like dangerous animals. There are snakes and there's lions and there's tigers. And some of us have added lizards to that list. Not sure about that, unless you're talking about the giant lizard, but those we don't have in Jamaica. So fear is important and useful. You should not, though, let fear overshadow you. You should not let fear ruin your life. You should not let fear prevent you from enjoying life. And after asking a very important question, one that you should ask yourself, what is that special gift that you bring to this world? You should identify it and make it manifest. What is that special gift you have? Because we all have a special gift. Reverend Sonia went back to the matter of fear and said that one way of overcoming fear is through the use of prayer power. Prayer power. Now there's prayer power in a sort of generic sense. Prayer power is good, but she also has a program on a Thursday, six o'clock. Prayer power, which has been going for 41 years. That, that is absolutely amazing. It's as old as the church. And, and, and thir oh, beg pardon, 31 years, 31 years. I was, was wondering how it was as old. And then, <laughs> and then we got the song, Count Your Blessings, because that certainly is one way of overcoming fear. When you focus on your blessings, you will no longer be fearful. So thank you, Reverend Sonia. Let's give her another clap, please.